in what is now Russia. And it's always Russia, isn't it? <laughs> it's Russia today, it's Russia 250 million years ago. These volcanoes at the end of the Permian, they're not like normal volcanoes, they're not like any volcanoes humans have ever seen. You know, this wasn't the Hawaiian volcanoes releasing some lava, this wasn't Mount Pinatubo blowing its top one day. No, these were uh, flood volcanoes, basically. They were enormous holes in the earth that opened up, you know, Grand Canyon-sized holes that just spewed out rivers of lava for hundreds of thousands of years at a time. And all that lava covered a land area much larger than all of Europe put together today. But that wasn't really the problem. The problem was all the carbon dioxide and methane that came up with the lavas as that lava burnt through the earth on its way to those volcanoes. And that led to runaway global warming, and that caused a mass extinction. That was the biggest mass extinction that's ever happened, the closest that life has ever come to completely dying out ever since the first life forms evolved four billion years ago. And what happened at the end of the Permian was, depending on how you count the victims and survivors, somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of all species died out. But there were some survivors, and those survivors would then forge their own way in a largely empty world uh, in the next interval of time that came after the Permian, and that's the Triassic period. And so when I was a student, I was really obsessed with this extinction at the end of the Permian. And I wanted to know what lived and what died, and in particular, I was really interested in what happened in the Triassic as this new world emerged, as those few survi survivors had to build new ecosystems as the Earth recovered. And so I spent a lot of time in Poland looking for fossils. And maybe Poland doesn't strike you as a place that you know, fits the stereotype you might see on TV of where people go out looking for fossils. You see those guys that look like Indiana Jones that go out to the desert and brush the sand off the bones. And you know, sometimes we go to the desert to look for fossils, but really, uh, we look for fossils anywhere where there's rocks of the right age and the right type that they might have the, the remains of stuff that once lived buried inside of those rocks. And in Poland, there's all these quarries where they mine clay to make bricks, and you can follow the layers, layer by layer by layer of clay, those layers span the Permian period, they go across the extinction, they go into the Triassic, and those layers are full of fossils. And really, you can read them like the pages in a book. And so our friend Gregor Scherer grew up in central Poland, and he started to collect these fossils when he was just in high school, when he was a teenager, and he became uh, just a bloodhound for being able to search out these fossils in his backyard and then across Poland. <coughs> now, the types of fossils we find there are fossils that look like these, and I realize that looking at these photos, uh, you're probably unimpressed. You know, this doesn't look like a, a T-Rex skeleton on display in a museum. It doesn't look like some of the fossils you have on display here, you know, in the Zoology Museum or the Cedric Museum, for instance. But these are fossils. They're humble fossils. They are fossil footprints and handprints. And that's what you see here. There's two of them. There's a footprint and there's a handprint. They're just a few centimeters long, uh, just about the size of a, a cat's paw. And they were made by an animal that would have looked something like this. There's skeletons from other parts of the world that fit those footprints, kind of like Cinderella and the slipper. So we can tell that the animal that made them looked like this. It was a small animal. You could hold it in your arms. It had very long, gangly arms and legs. Clearly, this was a fast runner. It was a reptile, and it was a special kind of reptile that we call a dinosauromorph reptile, and that's just the fancy kind of tongue twister name for the immediate cousins and ancestors of dinosaurs. So this type of reptile making its tiny little footprints in Poland at the very beginning of the Triassic, only a million years or so after the extinction, we start to find its footprints this thing basically was the great, 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 great grandparent of the dinosaurs. And that might surprise you, because when you, even when you look at this animal, I think it, it just doesn't seem particularly scary or monstrous. You know, when we think of dinosaurs, we think of T-Rex, and we think of brontosaurus, and we think of these enormous animals. But dinosaurs didn't start that way. They started out small, and they started out humble, and they started out really as bit characters in their ecosystems, vastly outnumbered by the other types of animals that were the dominant ones of the day. And we found a lot of fossils of these other animals that were really lording it over the dinosaurs.
dinosaurs for 30 to 40 million years in the Triassic period. We've done a lot of work in Portugal, down in the Algarve. Maybe some of you have been to the Algarve, probably for the beaches, beautiful beaches, <laughs> some of the best places in the world to go on holiday. But if you go about 20 miles or so inland from those beaches into the scrublands, you see these red hills and this, this red rock, these are mudstones that were formed in rivers and lakes during the Triassic period. And we went there because a student, a geology student, found some bones and we heard about this Triassic age bones. Let's see what's out there. Maybe we'll find some dinosaurs, maybe some of the oldest dinosaurs in the world. You can find them in Portugal. Well, we spent several years there, a lot of time there. We found a lot of bones. It was a really fun place to work. And we dug up these bones. You know, we put our tents up, our tarps up. We were digging these things up all day, encasing them in plaster jackets to protect the bones. But we never, still to this day, found a dinosaur. But we found dozens of skeletons going into this hillside of these types of animals. These hideous, enormous amphibians. Basically, imagine a salamander the size of a small car. Mm -hmm. That's what these dozens of fossil skeletons we have from Portugal are. And in fact, it looks like this layer of these fossils is so vast, there's probably hundreds of skeletons of these grotesque things there. So you can imagine if you were one of these early primitive dinosaurs whose fossils we've not found in Portugal yet, just because we think they are so rare, it is hard to find them as fossils. They were very rare at that time, but they would have lived there, most certainly. But imagine you would go anywhere near the rivers and the lakes and you would meet flocks of dozens or even hundreds, maybe even thousands of these brutish salamanders. And these were meat eaters and fish eaters. So these first dinosaurs would want to stay away from the water. But it wasn't really any better on dry land because the Triassic was the age of the crocodiles. Now in today's world, crocodiles are plenty scary. You know, <laughs> you know, you hear all the time these stories online of some idiot, usually in Florida, uh, <laughs> <laughs> very intoxicated, um, you know, meeting uh, <laughs> an alligator. Uh, it usually doesn't end well. I mean, they're plenty scary. But when you think about it, they're not a particularly important Component of today's world. There's only about 25 species of crocs and gators. They all kind of live in the tropics and subtropics. They all live kind of at the interface of water and land. You don't have to worry about being attacked by an alligator you know, here in Cambridge. But back in the Triassic, there were tons of species of both early crocodiles and also a lot of their close cousins. And their cousins, some of them were nearly the size of buses. Others had armor and spikes all over their bodies. Some had sails on their backs. Some had no teeth at all, but they replaced their teeth with beaks. Others walked only on their hind legs. Others ate plants. And some, like these things in the lower right-hand corner there, these crop relatives, they were the top predators on land. So the point here is that back in the Triassic period, there were dinosaurs. They were starting to evolve and change after that end Permian extinction. But the dinosaurs were not very impressive. For 30 or 40 million years, dinosaurs were mostly the size of dogs, <clears throat> of humans, maybe up to the size of horses. That was it. They were not the top predators in their ecosystem. They were lower down on the food chain, really living in fear of these hideous salamanders and this great diversity of early crocodiles. But something changed. Of course something changed, or else we wouldn't have had an age of dinosaurs, and dinosaurs wouldn't be so famous. And what changed was, about 200 million years ago, as the Triassic period ended, the supercontinent began to break apart. Uh, and of course, of course, it is. that's why we have separate continents today. Now, today, the continents are separated by water. You know, you can see South America and Africa fit together like puzzle pieces. That's because they once were together, but they're separated by the Atlantic Ocean. And so Pangaea basically began to unzip along what's now the Atlantic seaboard. <clears throat> but before the water came in to fill those cracks, once again, the Earth bled lava. And there was a period of massive volcanic eruptions. And once again, that caused global warming. 
and that led to a mass extinction. Not as severe as that one 50 million years earlier, but still a pretty bad one. And that extinction decimated the crocs. It killed off most of those early crocs, leaving just a few species that made it through that were the ancestors of today's crocs, decimated those giant amphibians. But the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs were the great survivors of that extinction. They sailed right on through. It's like they barely even noticed the volcanoes and the climate change. And I wish I could tell you why that was. It would make the story so much more convincing for you. But I don't know the answer. We don't know the answer. We don't know why the dinosaurs were able to deal, deal so well with that extinction when their competitors, the animals that had been doing so well before, succumbed to that extinction. It's one of the great mysteries of dinosaurs. I think maybe the biggest mystery that remains to be solved about dinosaurs, and there's still lots we don't know, but I think this is the big one. I think somebody will figure this out. And there's lots of theories, by the way. The dinosaurs grew faster, they were smarter, they ran faster, they had feathers that keep themselves warm. All kinds of ideas. Or maybe it was just dumb luck that they made it through. We don't really know. But what we do know is the consequence of that. The consequence is that that <coughs> extinction wiped out a lot of the animals that were keeping the dinosaurs at bay. And then as the Triassic ended, the next interval of time gone, that's the time we call the Jurassic period, and there's a reason why it's called Jurassic Park, not Triassic Park, because Triassic Park would be a book and a film about giant salamanders and weird crocs. That would be a cool, cool thing, I'm sure. But it wouldn't make you know, a billion dollars with the little box. Um, so there's a reason it was called Jurassic Park, because it's really the Jurassic when we start to see the dinosaurs we all know and love, the big ones, the huge meat eaters, the size of buses that were at the top of the food chain, the long neck dinosaurs that got to be bigger than jet airplanes, and all the fantastic dinosaurs with horns and spikes and frills and duck bills and plates on their backs and dome heads and so on. So much of this diversity evolved in the Jurassic after the dinosaurs were free of those early competitors. And right now, uh, we are in a really a golden age of dinosaur discovery. People are finding more dinosaurs than ever before. Somewhere around the world, there's a, a new species that's found once every single week on average. And it sounds like a crazy number, I know, but I promise you it's true. There's about 50 new dinosaur species that come to life every year. Totally new species. And it's because more people are looking than ever before. People all over the world, young people especially, young paleontologists, and it used to be, even just a few decades ago, there weren't that many paleontologists. They were mostly, you know, the little boys that grew up obsessed with dinosaurs in America or Canada or Britain, you know, that would go on to a career in this very uh, niche field. But now paleontology has opened up, and so many of the amazing discoveries are made by young scientists from China and Brazil and Argentina and Mongolia and South Africa, just all over the world. And people are finding dinosaurs really everywhere. Anywhere where there's rock of the right age, Triassic, Jurassic, or Cretaceous, the right type, the sort of rocks that were formed on land, lakes, rivers, beaches, the kind of place the dinosaurs lived, you might find dinosaur fossils. And I think nothing exemplifies this reality of us finding dinosaurs in more and more places than the fact that we even have them in Scotland. <laughs> and I tell you, Scotland does not fit that image you see on the Discovery Channel of Indiana Jones going out to the desert and brushing the sand off of the bones. But you can find dinosaurs in Scotland. But it was only in the 1980s that the first dinosaur fossil was reported from Scotland. It was a single footprint on a block of rock that had fallen from the cliff. Now, it was like 200 years earlier in England that people were finding dinosaurs and studying them and putting them on display. So we're behind the game in Scotland. Part of the reason is there's really only one place in Scotland that has the right type of rocks. And that's this place, I think one of the most beautiful places in the world. A place maybe where some of you have been. Uh, and this is the Isle of Skye off the west coast, way up north. And, uh, a lot of big Hollywood blockbusters have been filmed there over the last decade or so because of the incredible scenery. It looks like it's something out of a Tolkien book or something like that. It's just absolutely enchanting place. But a lot of those rocks, at least, and especially along the, um, the East Coast, 
are carved into cliffs and into rock formations. That rock, in addition to being beautiful, that rock is Jurassic in age, and it has fossils in it. And so we go to Sky. We went every year and did big trips every year before the pandemic. Things have kind of slowed down since then. But we bring our students to Sky. Our students always make the best fossil discoveries. As much as I would love to claim the best <coughs> discoveries for myself, never. It's always the students that make the best ones. Uh, and the best example of that is uh, one of your alums from Cambridge here, uh, Amelia Penny, who did her undergrad degree here. That's Amelia in the middle there. Amelia was doing a, a, a PhD with a, a very famous paleontologist in Edinburgh named Rachel Wood. Uh, Ra and Rachel's an, a, a, an expert on the origin of animals and the origin of skeletons and the origin of coral reefs. And that's what Amelia did for her PhD. But she came out the sky with us and she found this amazing fossil out on the tidal flats. Uh, and what she's looking at is actually the head of a pterosaur, of a pterodactyl, one of those flying reptiles that lived at the same time as dinosaurs, the things that glided and flew over the heads of dinosaurs. And that head led to a neck, which led to a body, which led to some wings, which led to basically a beautiful skeleton. And we announced it last year, actually, as a new species. We call it Yarskianak, a Gallic uh, term for flying reptiles. Now, I would love to tell you a lot more about it, but pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. <laughs> and so I don't want to get too far off course here. Pterosaurs are dinosaur cousins, they're not dinosaurs. But the point is, our students find amazing stuff. And it's really a great laboratory, a great field laboratory for students to learn techniques. And so, for instance, here's Moji, who came from Nigeria to do a, a master's with us. She did the same master's course that Pei Chen did uh, a few years ago. But Moji was part of the first group of a 54 Pei Chen. That's Pei Chen, by the way. I'm going to raise your hand. To... <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so Moji studied the fish because it's, you can find all kinds of fossils on the sky. And the rocks are really hard. You, know, you can't use hammers and chisels and kind of you know, chisel the, the fossils out of the rocks like you might see on TV because the rocks are too hard. They're harder than concrete. And so Moji's using this angle grinder to cut out these little fish bones. But when it comes to dinosaurs, you need bigger tools. <laughs> and so we, we actually have to use uh, diamond tip saws to cut the dinosaur bones out of the rock. And this is Judy Ross, our dear friend. She grew up on the Isle of Skye. He's the only person I know who's ever literally built his own museum. He took the ruins of a one-room schoolhouse, a 19th century schoolhouse, built it up into a museum, and he displays his discoveries. He collects not only fossils, but a lot of archaeological artifacts and artifacts from sky history. He's a great guy. None of the work we do on the island is possible without locals like you. And there he is, using one of his saws to cut a dinosaur going out of the rock. Amazing. Uh, I could keep going about Sky, but I just want to tell you about one discovery that we made a few years ago that exemplifies why Sky is important in the global story of dinosaurs. And this is a discovery that we made up at the north, far northeastern tip of the island in a place called Duntoam. Uh, and I'm standing up on this hill in the shadow of the ruins of a 14th century castle, very Scottish scene, and uh, I'm taking this photo. And those of you that have ever been to Sky might be looking at this photo and saying, wait a minute, that doesn't look like Sky, because you can see the sky, the blue sky. Uh, there's no rain. There's barely any clouds. It's a beautiful day. So it's like, why are we not looking for fossils? Like, why am I out by the castle taking a photo of the coast? Well, the problem is that it's high tide. You see those waves are lapping up against the beach. Most of the fossils we find are in rocks exposed along the coast. We have to wait till the tide goes down. And when it does, this beach turns into a rock platform that juts out about 100 meters or so into those very, very, very cold waters. And uh, we went there a few years back because a geologist friend of ours found a little bone, and uh, he showed it to me, and I could see there, were, there was a line of holes, and I could tell there were two sockets. It was a jawbone, and it was the jawbone of a little crocodile, a crocodile just about the size of a pug dog, a cute little thing. Remember, we're in the Jurassic period now. That extinction's happened. Most of those crocs have died out, the big ones from the Triassic. So the ones that are left are not very impressive. But still, hey, it's a fossil. That's neat. So you know, we hoped that we would go there and maybe find a skull of that crocodile or a skeleton of that crocodile, maybe even a dinosaur. And so we went there, and we spent all day 
during the low tide part of the cycle, we were on our hands and knees looking for anything we can find, and we found nothing other than some sharp teeth for Moji. That was it. And so it was very frustrating. It was a cold day, it was windy, and we were not very happy. But that's the reality of paleontology. You, know, you see these dinosaur discoveries like go viral online, and you think every time paleontologists go out to look for fossils, they find some new species. Well, no, no, a lot of new species are being found because a lot of people are looking and putting in a lot of time and a lot of energy. But it's a discovery science, and most of the time we go out, we look, we don't find anything. And it's frustrating, you gotta be patient. And, and this was just one of those days, or so it seemed, because as we were walking back, uh, we started to look at these tide pools. And there were a bunch of these tide pools. You know, they had seaweed in there, and they had uh, uh, hermit crabs and barnacles and limpets and all the stuff that you see in the Scottish seaside. Just, but then, the more that we looked, we saw, wait a minute, there's actually a lot of these tide pools, and they're all kind of the same shape and size. And in fact, there were, there were more than 100 of them. It just seemed a bit weird. They have so many tide pools in this one narrow part of the beach, all kind of uniform in size. We started to see there was a pattern to that, a bit of a left-right, left-right zigzagging pattern. We could see that some of these holes, we could see them from the side, and we could see they were actually impressed into the rock. So this wasn't just the tide eroding the rock. There was something that was impressing into the sand and the mud back when it was still soft, before it hardened into rock. Some of these holes were filled in by a harder rock, and that rock brought out some features, some little bits you can see sticking out of the top of that one. And sometimes we saw that these things were paired together. There was a big uh, horseshoe-shaped one and a smaller crescent-shaped one in front. And these things, they were big. There's a little bit of variation in size, but by and large, they're all around this size. And you can see just from a lens cap for scale, this is a big thing. It's about this big. It's about the size of a car tire. So each of these holes were about the size of a car tire. So after a few minutes, it dawned on us that actually, you know, this was a great day. We had found fossils, just not the fossils we were expecting. We didn't find any crocodile skeletons, but we found fossils. And they weren't bones at all. They were footprints and handprints, but so much bigger than those ones from Poland. Because we're now in the Jurassic period, dinosaurs are getting bigger. And there's really only one type of dinosaur, actually one type of animal that's ever lived uh, on land in the entire history of the Earth <clears throat> that was so big that every time its hand or foot touched the ground, it was a hole the size of a car tire. And uh, these were, of course, the giant long neck dinosaurs, the things like Diplodocus and Brontosaurus, the dinosaurs that we call the sauropod dinosaurs. Now, the ones that were making their tracks on the Isle of Skye in the Jurassic period, 170 million years ago, they were about the size of three elephants put together. And at that time, they were some of the biggest things that had ever lived in the history of the Earth. Now, fast forward uh, into the Cretaceous period, the next interval of time, some of basically the descendants of these animals got even bigger, and there were different species of sauropod that weighed more than Boeing 737, which is just astounding. By far the biggest things that have ever been done. And it's crazy to think that these animals, they hatched from eggs that were about the size of a coffee cream. And they only lived for like 50 or 60 years, we can tell from the growth rings in their bones, and they grew to sizes heavier than like an easy jet airplane. It just boggles the mind. But we find their fossils on the sky. Now, the more we look, the more we find more track sites on the sky. We find bones as well, but we find more dinosaur tracks. And my student Paige, who came from America uh, to study with us, um, she is uh, an expert on many things. She has training in geology. She also has training in engineering. So she's very good at building contraptions and different bits of equipment and running experiments and stuff. And so Paige has taken uh, to using drones to map a lot of these track sites. And she's even built some of her own rigs for mapping these sites because it can be hard to use drones in the you know, Hebridean wind. So, so Paige has done a great job, not just at that first track site, but at many other track sites we found. Because we keep finding more when we go to work on the island. And the more we see, the more that we see there's this entire community of dinosaurs that lived on the Isle of Skye 170 million years ago. They were making their footprints 
in shallow water. They were wading <clears> in <throat> shallow lagoons back during a time when Scotland had a subtropical climate. If you can envision something as crazy as a subtropical Scottish climate. And so there's the long neck dinosaurs, of course. We have stegosaurs, the ones with the plates on their necks. We have footprints of early uh, duck billed dinosaurs, plant eaters that had beaks like ducks. And we have footprints of different types of meat eaters, some of which were tiny little things, probably close cousins of Velociraptor. Others were probably the size of a Jeep or a, a really big car. Now, one of the meat eaters that uh, we find fossils of is this animal with, with footprints that indicate it's about the size of a human. And that's the animal that's in the foreground here, it's this one. Now this one, and I only, you can see it's only walking on its hind legs. Its front legs are shorter, those, leg, those uh, front arms are shorter, those are free to use to grab things and to slash things <laughs> and to kill things. Uh, and this, this is what we call a theropod dinosaur, it's a member of a big group of meat-eating dinosaurs. And this is actually a very early cousin of T-Rex. Now, all, on the Isle of Scotland, we just have footprints. We're hoping to find bones of this animal, but there's some better skeletons of these early tyrannosaurs from other parts of the world. There's some great ones from China. And this is one called Guanlon. It lived about 100 million years before T. rex, and it was only the size of one of us. And that is how tyrannosaurs got their start. We think of T. rex, you know, the most famous, ferocious dinosaur of all. But tyrannosaurs didn't start that way. Just like dinosaurs themselves, the tyrannosaurs, they also started small and humble. They had to earn their way to the top. So somehow, evolution, over the course of 100 million years, which is a lot of time for evolution to play with, somehow evolution took this kind of animal, the size of a human, and turned it into a brute the size of a bus. Turned into the T-Rex. So how did that happen? Well, we have some new fossils that help tell the story. And these fossils come from Uzbekistan. So another example of how people are finding dinosaurs all over the world, maybe in unexpected places. Now these fossils are important because they are intermediates. They're in between those oldest, smallest tyrannosaurs <coughs> and things like T-Rex, which lived at the very end of the age of dinosaurs. So these ones from Uzbekistan, these are tyrannosaurs that are just about the size of a horse, and they lived in between those oldest ones in the world. Now, what's really important here is this thing on the screen, I know this looks like a formless lump of rock, which it basically is. It's a fossil that's been battered around. It's about the size of a grapefruit. But you can see a big hole in it. That's the hole where the spinal cord goes into the brain. So you're looking at the back end of a skull. Now, this skull we could put in a CAT scanner, and we did so. There's a CAT scanner here as well. This is very common in paleontology now. CAT scanning fossils using the x-rays of the scanner to see inside the fossils, just like a medical doctor might use a CAT scanner to see inside our bodies. And that lets us see stuff that's inside. So what would be inside of a dinosaur skull? Well, brain, the ear, blood vessels, nerves, sinuses, all of these things that can tell us more about what those dinosaurs were actually like as real living animals. Now, when we CAT scan this fossil, the x-rays allowed us to build a digital model, and that allowed us to reconstruct what the brain of this tyrannosaur looked like. And that's this part in blue here. That's the back end of the brain. And that thing that looks kind of like a pretzel, uh, that's the inner ear. Those are the canals of the inner ear, the parts of the ear, and we have them too, that help our sense of balance. Now, the part sticking down from the pretzel that looks kind of like an ice cream cone or something, now uh, that's the cochlea. Well, we have a cochlea, ours is all long and coiled up, but this is the dinosaur version. The cochlea is what basically hears sound. It relays sound to the brain. So there's, it, aside from just being like, well, that's really cool, we can see the brain of the ear of this tyrannosaur. Aside from that, this is actually really important because it tells us a few things. First of all, <coughs> that brain is really big for a horse-sized reptilian creature. So that tells us that this tyrannosaur was pretty smart. It was involving bigger brains and keener intelligence. While it was still in the side of the horse, it was not the top predator in its ecosystem. Now that ear, we know from modern day animals that the longer the cochlea, the greater range of sounds the animal can hear, and that is a long cochlea. 
So what does this mean? This is telling us that tyrannosaurs were evolving bigger brains, higher intelligence, sharper senses, while they were still pretty small. While they were not at the top of the food chain. Maybe these things were part of their survival strategy for living in the shadows of other giant, scary dinosaurs of the time. But in the middle part of the Cretaceous period, there was a little extinction. We don't know much about it. It's one of these mysteries. There's not a lot of fossils that tell the story, but we can tell that some of the other big groups of carnivorous dinosaurs that were around in the Jurassic and the early Cretaceous, things like Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus, these groups either went extinct or became very decimated at, in this middle part of the Cretaceous. But the Tyrannosaurus made it through. Why? Maybe their intelligence helped them. We don't know. But they made it through. And on the other side, then, there was basically an opening, a job opening for top predators. And the Tyrannosaurs filled that opening. And this is where you get the giant, supersized Tyrannosaurs, the ones that weighed several tons, culminating in T. rex, the biggest one of all, which lived right at the end of the age of dinosaurs, 66, 67 million years ago. It was the size of a bus. Literally, it was. That's true. It weighed seven or eight tons as an adult. It had a head that was the size of a bathtub I could fit inside its jaws. Uh, it had more than 50 teeth. Each one was like the size and shape of a banana, but a banana with sharp serrations like a steak knife that could bite through the bones of its prey. And it did that. We find fossils of the shattered bones of Triceratopses and duck-billed dinosaurs that T-Rex ate. And then it had the pathetic few little arms, of course. <laughs> Trying to figure out what those did. Actually, we have a project going on about that now. We're about to submit that. We think we maybe figured it out. And it, 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 they were probably not useless. They probably didn't serve a function. Um, the biggest, fattest dinosaur of all. One of, if not the biggest, pure meteor that lived on the land in the entire history of the Earth. But what made T. rex so amazing isn't that it was just very big, because it inherited the big brains, high intelligence, sharp senses from its ancestors. So T. rex had both brawn and brains. And to me, that's what made it the ultimate dinosaur predator. And it is my favorite dinosaur, by the way. <laughs> and I know that's very cliche, but that's one. <laughs> because it was growing in brain. Now, while tyrannosaurs were getting bigger over time, there was another group of dinosaurs that was doing the opposite. And these dinosaurs were getting smaller and smaller over time. They were actually close cousins of T-Rex. And these were small, meat-eating dinosaurs, but basically the raptor dinosaurs. Things like Velociraptor. Now this here is the real Velociraptor. Don't believe what you see in the movies. The real Velociraptor was only about the size of a poodle, a miniature poodle. And it had feathers on its body. It even had wings on its arms. And this is not some mad hallucination of a crazy artist. But this is real. And we know this from real fossils. And these fossils are by far the most important dinosaurs that have been discovered in, in my lifetime. And the first ones were found in 1996, three years after Jurassic Park came out, by the way. So that's why you didn't see a raptor that looks like that in Jurassic Park, which is bad timing. But in the mid-90s, there were farmers in northeastern China in this province called Liaoning Province, way tucked up there. There's a long border with North Korea, way up in northeastern China. It's a land of farms, a land of factories, a land of rolling hills. And farmers started to find some incredible things in the mid-90s. And once the first farmers found them, that really kicked off basically like a gold rush. And what they found were these beautiful skeletons of dinosaurs covered in feathers. And there are now thousands of these that have been found. And it's not just dinosaurs that are found there, by the way. There's mammals, there's fish, there's lizards, there's plants. There were entire ecosystems that were buried by volcanic eruptions, kind of like Pompeii, when Pompeii was buried by Mount Vesuvius. And those volcanic eruptions locked in the feathers and the soft tissue. Normally, those things decay away. So this is like a one in a trillion site of, of exceptional fossil preservation. And it took until the 90s to now, the discovery of these feathered dinosaurs told us a few things. First of all, they were really the final piece of evidence, the final nail in the coffin, or whatever cliche you want to use, that birds evolved from dinosaurs. That's an idea that goes back to the time of Darwin, that it's one that people were debating a lot from really the 1860s until the 1990s. This is still the deal. 
Only birds have feathers today. Feathers are very complex structures. So seeing these dinosaurs with feathers, in addition to all the other evidence that builds up to show that dinosaurs and birds are so similar, that proved that birds evolved from dinosaurs. The other thing that these fossils tell us is how feathers and how flight evolved. How evolution took dinosaurs that basically lived on the ground or maybe climbed into trees and turned them into a flying machine. What these fossils tell us, first of all, is so many different types of dinosaurs had feathers. There's meat-eating dinosaurs and plant-eating dinosaurs from China with feathers. There's lots of little dinosaurs with feathers, things that were just the size of pigeons, the size of dogs. But there's a tyrannosaur with feathers that was like eight or nine meters long and weighed over a ton. And so if you map this onto the family tree of dinosaurs, I think it's an inescapable conclusion to predict the common ancestor of dinosaurs had feathers. And in fact, there's evidence that pterosaurs may have had some feathers too, not forming their wing, but feathers on their bodies. That would suggest feathers go back even farther in time. So really, feathers were a normal thing for dinosaurs. We just haven't realized it until recently because it's so hard to preserve in these fossils. And the same way that hair is something that all mammals have in one way or another because our common ancestor had it, feathers were probably the same for dinosaurs. But the feathers I'm talking about were these type of feathers, simple feathers. This is part of the tail of one of these tyrannosaurs. Those things that look like scratches in the rock above the tail, those are feathers. They are simple little strands. They look like little bits of hair. So clearly these dinosaurs, and most dinosaurs had these types of feathers. Clearly, none of those dinosaurs could fly with those feathers <clears throat> any more than we can fly with our hair. So feathers must have evolved for something else. And they probably, we don't know for sure, but they probably evolved for the same reason hair evolved in mammals, and that was to help insulate the body as a way to control body temperature. Both dinosaurs and mammals were developing higher metabolisms. Eventually, they would both become fully warm-blooded Hair and feathers were probably part of that. So feathers did not first evolve for flying. They evolved probably for insulation. And most dinosaurs kept those kind of feathers. But this one group of dinosaurs, this advanced group of meat-eating dinosaurs, basically the raptor dinosaurs, elaborated those feathers. And they packed their feathers ever more densely around their bodies as their bodies were getting smaller and smaller over evolutionary time. And they started to line up those feathers on the arms. And those feathers started to change. They started to branch out. They turned from individual little strands into brushes, basically. And those brushes flattened out and turned into the quill pen feathers that we recognize today in modern birds. This right here is a fossil wing. And you can see the arm here, the forearm and the hand with the claws. You can see these things down here, our, our feathers. And the size, the shape, the positioning of those feathers, the bones they attach to, the way they lay out over each other, basically the same as in a bird today. This is a wing, but this is not a bird. This is a raptor dinosaur. This is this raptor dinosaur, this beautiful fossil that I had the incredible privilege of being invited to help study by my dear friend Jun Chang Wu in China, one of China's great dinosaur hunter. And there it is in all of its glory. I mean, to me, this looks like something you see in an art museum. This is a beautiful fossil, these chocolate brown bones in this gray limestone. Almost all the bones are there. And you can see there's feathers over the entire body and there's wings on those arms. Now, this dinosaur, this raptor, was about the size of a big dog. Its body was too big for wings of that size to keep itself in the air, basically, if it moved those wings around. And so we don't really call it a bird because it couldn't employ that active form of flapping flight like a bird. Now I realize we have a lot of the world's experts here on early birds, so forgive me for being cavalier with the definition of bird. But by and large, when we talk about the origin of birds, the origin of flight, we're trying to figure out where in dinosaur history that the bodies got small enough, the wings got big enough, that they could start flapping those wings to fly. The important point is there's a whole bunch of raptor dinosaurs that have feathers, that have wings on their arms, but they, their bodies are too big for their wings to keep them aloft. And so it seems like wings also evolved for something else, not for flying. And one leading candidate is for display to attract mates and to make rivals. Birds do this with their feathers today. We've got to remember, feathers do lots of different things. They don't only, they're not only used for birds to fly. And 
And so basically, if you think of the first wings as advertising billboards sticking out of the arms of these animals, that's probably what they were. Now, if this dinosaur started to move those arms, there would have been a lot of drag with them, but they it really couldn't flap them to keep them airborne. But you can imagine, if you took a dinosaur like this, a raptor like Gen 1 law, which, by the way, if you saw this thing alive, you'd just call it a bird, a freakish bird. I mean, with big claws on its feet, teeth, and a long tail. Is that any weirder than a ostrich or an emu or something? It's scary, maybe. I don't know, those of you that are run into a castle or anything, it's not scary, I don't know. But anyway, it's not too hard, I don't think, to envision natural selection. Taking an animal like this that already had feathers that evolved for insulation way back in dinosaur history, that already had wings that evolved for display. Remember, the bodies of these raptors were getting smaller and smaller over time. So at some point, the threshold would have been crossed. The bodies would have gotten smaller. Those advertising billboards would have gotten big enough and if they're display items, they'd probably be getting bigger in different species, just so they can attract mates better or scare off the rivals better. And you can envision that sweet spot being hit where the body's small enough, the wings are big enough that when those wings, those advertising billboards, are moved around just by the laws of physics, they're going to generate a little bit of lift, a little bit of thrust, and these raptor dinosaurs can start fluttering about in the air a little bit. And at that point, a threshold would have been crossed, natural selection could modify them into ever better flight. And that's probably what happened. What it means is that today's birds are dinosaurs. They are descended from dinosaurs. They are part of the dinosaur family tree. They are dinosaurs in the same way that a T-Rex or a Brontosaurus is a dinosaur. I know that's a weird thing to think about. And a lot of people try to argue, and we got that a lot with the you know, Jurassic World Dominion film, because we finally got feathers on some of those dinosaurs in the film this summer. We heard all kinds of commentary from viewers about, oh, you know, you can't call birds dinosaurs. They're so different than dinosaurs. You know, maybe they evolved from dinosaurs. You got to call them something else. No, that's not how it works. Birds evolved from dinosaurs. They are part of the dinosaur family album. The way to think about it is the same way we think about bats. What's a bat? That's a mammal. Duh, right? It has hair. It feeds its babies milk. It has molar teeth. It has all the stuff that makes mammals mammals. Because bats are just a peculiar type of mammal that evolved from other mammals, got small, evolved wings, developed the ability to fly. And birds are the dinosaur equivalent of that. They're just a strange type of dinosaur that got small, evolved wings, and developed the ability to fly. Now, the difference is all the other dinosaurs died out, leaving only birds. But imagine some alternative future where every type of mammal dies except for bats. And that's kind of the world that we're in. So, dinosaurs live on. And in fact, there are more than double the number of dinosaur species alive today as there are mammals. And some of them are majestic, beautiful animals. Dan Field and his group here, many of whom are in attendance, are some of the world's leaders in studying the early evolution of birds. And not just early birds, but modern birds too. And a lot of modern birds are pretty awesome. Some not so much. Uh, <laughs> we've got a lot of these little bastards in Edinburgh. Because uh, we have so much coastline. And I hate these things, you know. Every, but I think, you know, and certainly I sense it when, when I'm out with my family and, and we're trying to eat chips on the beach and one of these little jerks dive bombs us and tries to take our chips. I think in that moment, in that moment, in the ferocity, the tenaciousness, the intelligence, the feistiness, the nastiness, I think you can sense the inner velociraptor in a seagull. And that's only a little bit of a, you know, kind of analogy term of phrase thing because actually velociraptors are some of the very closest relatives of birds. But birds live on today, that means dinosaurs live on, but all the other dinosaurs died out, and all the other dinosaurs died about 66 million years ago when the world looked like this. The supercontinent had been breaking apart, the world was looking more and more modern, this was the time T-Rex was alive, and there were different types of dinosaurs living on all the different land masses. And T-Rex, for instance, lived in that sliver of crust in, in Western North America. But it was a time of great dinosaur diversity in the late Cretaceous. And then literally one day, one, I don't know, Monday evening, let's say, <laughs> um, this giant, you know, six mile wide rock that was traveling like 10 times faster than a speeding bullet. It was hurtling through the cosmos. It was a piece of space junk. It could have gone anywhere, but it just happened to make a beeline to the and it smashed into the earth with the force of over a 
a billion nuclear bombs put together. And it punched a hole in the crust more than 100 miles wide. You can see that crater today. You can see parts of it in Mexico. And it unleashed fury. It unleashed bedlam. Tsunamis, earthquakes, hurricane force winds, wildfires. The earth was reshaped instantaneously. And then all the dirt, dust, and grime from the collision, the soot from the wildfires, went up into the atmosphere, circulated around the world, blocked out the sun for a few years, maybe even up to a decade. The earth went dark and cold. It was a global nuclear winter. Plants couldn't photosynthesize, and they died. The only reason plants were able to make it through was their seeds could survive in the soil. And with no plants to eat, the plant-eating dinosaurs and other animals died. And then the food chains really collapsed like houses of cars. And dinosaurs were there to witness it. T-Rex was there when the asteroid hit. These duckbill dinosaurs were there when the asteroid hit. But it seems like, although they had been so successful for so long, they couldn't deal with that sudden moment of environmental change. They were really well adapted to their world. But many dinosaurs were big. For many dinosaurs, it took them many years to go from a hatchling into an adult. Most dinosaurs couldn't hide very easily. Most dinosaurs had very specialized diets. Those kind of traits worked for the dinosaurs <clears throat> over those tens of millions of years when the dinosaurs became very well adapted. But in that sudden moment of change, a lot of those things became liabilities. And that's probably why modern style birds, in part, were the only dinosaurs to make it Grew. They grew fast, they could eat seeds, they could hide easily, they could fly away from danger, and so on. But there were some other animals that made it through as well. And those other animals are, have much more to do with us and our story. And a lot of my research over the last several years has turned to trying to understand what happened after the asteroid hit. And I've spent a lot of time in New Mexico out in the Badlands. That does look like we're maybe Indiana Jones would go collect fossils. And it's one of the best places in the world where we're finding fossils of the very last dinosaurs, then seeing the extinction, and then finding fossils of the animals that took over from the dinosaurs. There are fossil birds there. They're very rare because their bones are so fragile. But there's other fossils, and, 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 and you see this. And we go out there, I train my students, this is Sarah, who's my very first PhD student. She's become one of the world experts in those animals that really took over from the dinosaurs. And we walk up these rocks, layer by layer, through the Cretaceous. Those rocks are, are just littered with dinosaur bones. You cannot walk without stepping on the busted shards of T. rex limb bones and vertebrae from sauropods. But then, those dinosaur bones abruptly stop. You see the extinction layer. And then, you start to find more fossils. But not dinosaur bones anymore. Fossils that look like these. And the eagle eye among you can see that these fossils here, a lot of them have teeth, and a lot of those teeth look quite a bit like the teeth we have. There's molars and premolars and incisors and canines, the classic teeth of mammals. So it's mammals, along with birds, that were able to survive that asteroid and make the world their own. And in particular, it was one type of mammal that really took advantage, and these were the placental mammals, the ones like us that give live birth to well-developed young. And this is a big point of focus in my research group. We are trying to understand how placental mammals survived the extinction and just proliferated afterwards and why that was. Part of what happened was not only did they survive and proliferate, but they got really big. For 150 million years, mammals lived with the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs and mammals both actually go back to the Triassic period. Their origin story is the same, the Triassic of Pangaea. But the dinosaurs got big. The mammals stayed small. For 150 million years, there was never a mammal bigger than magic. But, 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 although the dinosaurs were keeping the mammals small, the opposite was happening. The mammals were so good at being small and living in the shadows and surviving and enduring that they kept the dinosaurs big. You never saw a T. rex the size of a mouse or a triceratops the size of a rat. Mammals rule those niches. Then the asteroid hit. Then all the dinosaurs except for birds died. Now there was all this open space in, in, in the world for new ecosystems to form. And these placental mammals responded. And they got big. And within 200,000 years of the asteroid, we see 
placental mammals the size of pigs. Within a million or so years, the size of cows. So evolution is happening really quickly. And so a lot of our work is trying to understand the family tree, how these fossil mammals are related to today's mammals. We're trying to understand how their bodies and their behaviors and their biology change. <clears throat> like former postdoc Ornello led an incredible study using CAT scans that she published last year in Science uh, with, that tells us an incredible story that actually the, these mammals that survived the asteroid and started to diversify afterwards, they got so big so fast that their brains did not keep pace. So they actually got dumber for the first 10 million years or so after the asteroid. Their bodies got so big. So weird things. These were strange mammals, but they were the ancestors of us. We can even tell how long these mammals carried their babies in their wombs and how big their babies were when they were born and how long their babies drank milk. This is a project that my former postdoc Greg led, published this in Nature last year. He was able to look at the teeth and the bones from some of these first mammals living right after the extinction in New Mexico. You're able to see daily lines of growth in the teeth. He was able to study the chemical composition of those teeth. We're in a chemistry lecture at the other side. Yes. Mentioned chemistry, but it's important. There's actually signals that are still preserved in these teeth that are more than 60 million years old of changes in chemicals like zinc that we know change when a baby is born and when a baby stops drinking milk. So we can tell that these mammals, which got to be about the size of, uh, of large horses, they gave birth to babies that they raised in their womb for seven months. And those babies drank milk for only about one month until they started eating solid food. And then they became mature within a year and started to make their own babies. And this is the origin of the type of reproduction that we have. So what we're seeing, and this is all very much work in progress, we're just starting to publish this stuff, but what we're seeing is the origins of us and how we emerged from that extinction that killed the dinosaurs, which really goes to show how all of this is related together. So modern-day placental mammals, there's more than 6,000 species. All of these things on the screen are placental mammals. They are our closest cousins among the animals, and along with the birds that survived the extinction and diversify them to 10,000, 12,000, 14,000 species. I don't know what, <laughs> what number you guys are using, but a lot of species. This all emerged, this modern style of world, from the ashes of that asteroid. And if that asteroid was a near miss, if it just sailed right by the Earth, just whooshed through the upper layers of the atmosphere, who knows how evolution would have proceeded differently, but we probably would not be here. Because in New Mexico, just a few million years after the asteroid, we start to find a lot of fossils of this guy. Or I should say this mother, really, because this is a mother with a baby. About the size of a house cat, long gangly arms and legs, long fingers and toes to grip the branches. This is a primate, one of the oldest fossil primates, an ancestor of ours. And these things only appear after the asteroid. All this story is all interconnected, the story of dinosaurs, the story of us. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to answer any questions. I have a handful of books if anybody wants them. Um, you know, Ten pounds is what we can do them for. Uh, otherwise, um, I'm just happy to answer any questions you guys have. So thank you for your attention and again for the invitation. And, let, and we can go as long as you want. I don't know what time we have to be out of here or what time. I'll hand it over to you guys when I'm here answer anything you might want to know about dinosaurs or mammals. So thank you very much.